Hello, I'm Rory McKiernan and welcome to the Love and Courage podcast. This is a community supported podcast made possible by donors and patrons like you. You can help the podcast grow by subscribing to it, leaving a review and a rating and by spreading the word wherever you can. You can also support by becoming a donor or a patron and receive a Love and Courage t-shirt, badge, special mentions online and discounts on future workshops and events. You can find out more at loveandcourage.org. Thanks so much for your support. It really means a lot and is hugely appreciated. I hope you enjoy the podcast. So everything you do has both actual and symbolic. So, you know, the, the action of putting one plane out of action is one thing, but the symbolism of, uh, you know, a fragile community coming together to disarm uh, looks forward to a world of, of disarmament. Just like feeding someone a bowl of soup has a pragmatic but a symbolic that you hope everyone will be fed one day. My guest in this episode is Irish-Australian peace activist Kieran O'Reilly, who was once described by Martin Sheen as his personal hero. Kieran grew up in Australia and has spent most of his life in the Catholic worker movement. Kieran was mentored by renowned anti-war priest Father Daniel and Philip Berrigan, and for over 40 years now he's focused on supporting homeless communities and campaigning on Aboriginal, East Timorese, prisoner and refugee struggles. Kieran has participated in numerous and often controversial acts of civil disobedience, including the disabling of a B-52 bomber in New York on the eve of the 1991 Gulf War for which he served 13 months in US prisons. His actions also included disabling uranium mining equipment at the Australian Jabaluka mine site in 1998 and a US Navy warplane at Ireland's Shannon Airport during the 2003 invasion of Iraq. In recent years, he has been a friend, bodyguard and solidarity organiser for WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange and he has been a leading light in organising support for US Army whistleblower Chelsea Manning. Now in his late 50s, Kieran shows no sign of slowing down in his, in his activism. As you're about to hear, he's a fascinating person determined to do all he can to live out his values whilst challenging injustice and inequality. Here's Kieran O'Reilly. Okay, Kieran, thanks very much for joining me on the podcast today. Um, I know you're heading back to Australia soon from Ireland, and I often catch you when you're when you're coming and going. And I'm just curious right. as to what you're up to and what what brings you home. Uh, yeah, well, the past year, uh, well, the last six years, my focus has been solidarity with uh, Chelsea Manning and Julian Assange, who. I felt were largely abandoned uh, by the anti-war movement um, after exposing the war that millions marched against uh, the invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, so that's been it's been one of solidarity primarily rather than continued resistance. And um, I, I guess I think there's not much resistance because there's not much solidarity. So I think solidarity works very very important. So I've spent the year between. Um, Dublin here. Uh, three people host me each week. Someone puts me up for three nights a week, another guy for two nights and another guy for two. And the we have a Catholic worker farm near Watford that's for uh, destitute refugee women and women who've been trafficked into England and also a house for women and children. And there I, I've, they gave me a hermitage by, beside, beside a lake, which is very nice. And Does that mean you're kind of monk esque now? Do they, I uh, call you brother. Or? Yeah, well, it's always. I remember someone wrote a book called Contemplation and Resistance. I think it was James Douglas in the '60s, and Ched Myers once quipped that what we end up doing is contemplating resistance and resisting contemplation. Um, so it's always been primarily a spiritual journey for me, um, which is expressed. Um, and for me, it's radical Christianity. Um, and how, how are you with the contemplation bit? Because like activists by their nature go for action. And right. They don't tend to do so well with the, the quiet contemplation bit. Do you, can you manage that? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, like I'm struck by the beauty of humanity some days. And I just kind of, instead of rushing by that, kind of dwell on it, you know. And, um, and I, you know, I... I believe all human life is sacred because it's created in the image of God and you love God by loving humans. And um, that's the expression of God in the world. So um, that, and I do enjoy the sacraments and and uh, the rituals I was raised with. I remember when I was in prison in Texas, I was the only white boy in the jail and uh, I used to go to the mass, which was in Spanish. And 
being a linguistically landlocked Australian, uh, the rhythms of the mass were really nourishing for me. Um, so, you know, I prefer more home-based liturgies uh, uh, in workplaces or where people live rather than the kind of football stadiums of churches, you know. So when, when you, I mean, you drop in there that when I was in prison in Texas, I think mm. most people would be curious to know how does a white <laughs> Aussie end up in prison in Texas? Yeah, well, I guess... Uh, I, uh, it's a long story, really. I, I grew up in Brisbane, Australia. Yeah, tell me about your childhood and we'll, we'll get to prison later. Okay. And um, our, uh, our house, which we still have, uh, shares a back fence with the second largest army base in Australia. It's called Gallipoli Barracks now. But um, my grandmother had three brothers who went through that base to Gallipoli in France in World War One. One, I think one one of them got married there before shipping out, and um, uh, so when I was growing up there, I was born in 1960. So the backdrop was the Vietnam War. There were kids in our school whose fathers were in Vietnam. Um, we can literally and still do here the rifle range, automatic gunfire, and helicopters flying over the house and stuff. So that that was the backdrop, and. Um, my father was from uh, was born in Kilbegan, um, where his grandfather had a pub. Uh, his grandfather, paternal grandfather, had um, ha- uh, I think eloped um, with money from uh, Gorey in Wexford and bought a pub in Liverpool in about eighteen ninety called Man at the Wheel in Paradise Street, which would have been one of the main streets of old Liverpool. Um, and they swapped it apparently a handshake swap. Uh, for a pub in Kilbegan. So he was uh, <clears throat> raised in Clara um, and his father and his grandfather fell out over the Civil War. Um, my grandfather uh, had been in the IRA and uh, as my grandmother was in the women's section, I guess, and she was probably more working class background. She was an O'Connor. And my father was raised by her parents. He was the first of 13. And her parents were also influenced by Connolly. So he had a bit of a dose of socialism. And, and um, so really, when I was, I think, 11, the um, first demonstration I was taken to was a week after Bloody Sunday. So what was happening in the north of Ireland had a much bigger impact in our house than what was happening in Vietnam, even though people were shipping yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. Just, just backtrack a small okay. bit, Kieran, and how, how did the family end up in Australia then? What was the... Uh, my father uh, left uh, Claire at 16 to look for work in London, and then they were basically begging, you know, white Europeans, I guess, to go to Australia after World War Two, and I think it was two pounds, and you had to stay two years. Uh, so I think he just went out for a look and uh, kind of got stuck there. He didn't get back to Ireland for 26 years, you know, once having a family and stuff. And um, So he, he married local, local? He married Mary McCaffrey. His right. um, grandmother was from Milltown, Melbourne, could speak Irish. She lived with her as a child. And her grandfather, paternal grandfather, was from Inniskillen. And, and this uh, is in Queensland where you grew up? or uh, In Brisbane, Queensland. Yeah, they had moved down from Charters Towers in the north of Queensland. And I think her maternal grandparents were English and um, had had gone out for the gold rush in the north of Queensland. Yeah. So my maternal family were pretty mainstream, kind of conservative Catholics, and my father was much more Irish Republican and and um, a Labour Party person and someone who could see um, what the Aboriginal people were going through uh, was quite similar to what Irish people were going through. And um, so not a lot of Irish make that connection, you know. I think often, you know, may, maybe they share this with Israelis, but they think they have a monopoly on human suffering, you know. But to, he did make that connection with... Um, people who are being colonised. Is, so. is that a core component of solidarity to understand that 
the the struggle is all this it's it's one common struggle it is and it's i mean i guess the big thing is trans to transcend your own subjectivity isn't it and um like i could sit in an irish pub quite comfortably for the rest of my life but you know to interact with people from other cultures and other sexual orientations and other um classes uh requires a kind of transcendence and and you know especially i came engaged with uh, Aboriginal people when I was at high school um, and uh, that was a, you know really an eye-opener I guess and uh, you know, they were in the same space as me but in a totally different reality in terms of state oppression. Mm. Yeah I often find that there are parallels between the, the Aboriginal people of Australia and the travelling people in Ireland in that you may end up with one or two uh, travellers in a classroom when I was young and, and then they disappear, they'd be off travelling right. again maybe or, or things didn't work out in school. But And I know to some extent you could argue the suffering has been worse in Aboriginal Australia but I mean look at statistics around suicide and imprisonment. imprisonment yeah. and, uh, it's obviously complex issues but is, is that something you would have ever thought about? in your travels to Ireland have you seen that um or? yeah I think it's it's uh different because there's so many language groups uh, yeah. amongst Aboriginal people and it's so huge a continent um and like when I was eight years of age Aborigines didn't have the vote um see because they weren't they were almost seen as subhuman by yeah they they weren't counted in the census they didn't have citizenship yeah um I think in my state and when I was 11, uh, it was still uh, illegal to cohabitate with a native under the, under the vagrancy Yeah, because Queensland was one of the worst states for almost... Yeah, it's quite, I mean, though. Queensland's... Uh, well, when, and when, I be, when I was 17, um, they suspended all civil rights in Queensland, which I had done 10 years early in response to the anti-Vietnam War movement. So the... There was a real marriage between a very corrupt government that were making uh, corrupt money out of from mining companies, transnational mining companies and tourist industry companies, and a, a very corrupt police force that were running the brothels and casinos and drugs, and who um, <clears throat> willing to be used politically on the streets. So, um, and that eventually all came undone with the Royal Commission in the 1980s of Fitzgerald Inquiry, and. Uh, so we, you know, and, and the, the Aborigines would have uh, received the worst of that, you know, like de in terms of deaths in custody and um, abuse and uh, the soul and generation and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, it was, it was, um, it's pretty, it was pretty intense to engage that reality. Yeah. So you, you were mentioned earlier about Bloody Sunday and around the same time you had Vietnam and there were so many kind of global uh, issues at play and what first kind of captured your attention say as a teenager? Uh, it would have been uh, the, the struggle in the north of Ireland I think and um, kind of ethnically identifying with that I guess and um, I had a very good school teacher who, one thing he told me was don't let school get in the way of an education. Um, and he kind of challenged me uh, out of that kind of Irish Republican ghetto way of thinking. Mm. Uh, is this a history teacher by any chance? Yeah, it's a history English teacher yeah, who I'm still off, in contact quite, with. Yeah. Quite off same, yeah. I, uh, my history teacher, Hugh Barney O'Brien, uh, history and English, and helped me think in a very similar way, just outside of the classroom. Yeah. And, and he would have been at University of Queensland in 1968, which was a very active campus. Uh, not that he was active himself, but he was influenced by that. He was a Tagan from the north of Queensland, yeah. So he's, that's a relationship I've continued. Uh, I used to, when I'm in Brisbane, I'll go and see him every week and stuff like that. Mm. It's, it's, it's good to continue those links. Um, so also East Timor kind of was on your radar a lot. Yeah, well, it really... Um, you know, it was invaded when I was 15. I remember being engaged with that for about a year. And it really, uh, even when there was a huge peace movement in the 80s, Timor wasn't on the agenda. We were hearing more about El Salvador and the Philippines. And it wasn't really till Max Stahl, um, who I've met, um, courageously filmed the Santa Cruz ma massacre and got that out. 
and John Pilger used that in Death of a Nation. And I remember actually being in jail in Texas and someone used to photocopy articles from the New York Times and mail them to me. And there was a report on the Dilly Massacre and I remember thinking, oh, the East Timorese, you know, because for 16 years, uh, when the, most of the killing, when they killed a third of the population occurred, uh, there really wasn't much of a solidarity movement. And um, so when I was deported back to Australia, uh, in the early 90s, we started a house called Greg Shackleton House, and that was one of the five Australian journalists who were killed in Balibo just before the invasion. They were killed in the October of 75, and um, the invasion occurred in the December, just after Kissinger had visited Jakarta. Um, and that, in the early 90s, <clears throat> uh, and there was all way exploring ways we were complicit. There was a mining company, Petros Mining Company, headquartered in Brisbane, who were re- legally drilling in the Timor Sea, cooperating with the Indonesian military. Uh, they were training Indonesian troops at Kanangra and jungle warfare training just outside of Brisbane. So, you know, we did actions like we, we poured human blood over the Petros um, boardroom table, did an exorcism in their office, and um, we also blockaded uh, Kanangra. Um, You've written a book about that, haven't you? Yeah, remembering, forgetting, yeah. And w- one thing we did quite successfully was... The Labour Party government were going to deport um, a lot of Timorese to Portugal and we started, initiated a sanctuary movement that became quite big in Melbourne and Sydney where most of the Timorese were and that, that became quite a mass movement and a successful one and the government backed off. Uh, so the Australian government, Australia being quite next to Timor, wanted to deport them to far end Portugal, of the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I ended up living with Timorese in England later. Uh, from 96 to 99, and all these guys had occupied embassies in Jakarta. Um, and the Indonesian government came to the conclusion they were less of a pain in the ass in uh, Portugal. <laughs> so they let them go to Portugal and they came to England. And I see, you just mentioned there a minute ago about being deported back to Australia. Yeah. Deported from where for what? <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, in the late 70s, um, when I was at high school, in response to the anti-nuclear movement, the state government suspended the right to march, the right to hand out a leaflet, the right to gather in three or more people. Um, and, and while I was at high school at a large anti-uranium demonstration, uh, people decided to march and there were 418 of us arrested. It's 40 years ago this October, October 22nd, 77. And I remember the lead guitarist of the Saints and the lead guitarist uh, Ed Cooper and the guitarist Grant McLennan from the Go-Betweens who were arrested as well, you know, and um, that would have been the two big bands of my teenage years in Brisbane. Mm. And so uh, how did that and, all And so to- uh, after going through this, it was quite a mass movement for about three years, and there were thousands of arrests, and we were bashed and raided, and uh, a group of us decided we were influenced by a, a lecturer at university who'd been one of the main figures of the 60s, Brian Laver, who was an anarchist, and a few of us who were Catholics decided to explore Christian anarchist pacifism. And we thought we'd invented the concept, but then we discovered the Catholic worker movement in the States and the Berrigans, uh, who, were, who were, uh, had raided draft boards in the 60s and had started the plowshares movement. And so we started the Catholic worker house and aimed at Aboriginal street kids who were homeless. And we made our living off making bread and soap and uh, we opened a shop selling Nic- uh, Nicaraguan coffee and prisoners' art and stuff. And that went for about four years. So when that collapsed with exhaustion, um, I went to the States to to learn, to learn live with older people in that tradition. And um, that kind of, including Phil Berrigan, I lived with Phil for about a year and Liz McAllister at Jonah House and their kids. And that concluded with um, Moana Cole, who's from New Zealand, myself, um, Bill and Sue Frankelstrite, uh, breaking into an Air Force base in upstate New York, uh, near Syracuse. Um, and we managed to put a B-52 bomber out of action and close the runway. Uh, so we were arrested at gunpoint and um, interrogated by the FBI and uh, eventually put on trial in Syracuse and sentenced to a year in jail. So at the end of that year, um, I remember they, they they put me on Con Air and, uh, in New York and flew me to Oklahoma Penitentiary and um, and then on to El Paso and then they put me in a, a, a very 
a prison, in a, a jail in a very small town called Pecos in the in the outback of Texas, and um, it was twenty four of us in a cage, six cages welded together in one room. All doors of those cages would be open sixty miles a day. So you're in a room with one hundred and twenty, hundred and thirty men. It was predominantly Mexican, and um, so I did nine months there, and then they moved me to Louisiana Penitentiary in the later part of my sentence, and uh, and then they put, <laughs> at the end of my sentence, they charged me with overstaying a visa and being guilty of a crime of moral turpitude, and put $50,000 bail on me. And uh, I didn't, I'd never heard the word turpitude before, I didn't know what it meant, and uh, it's usually to do with high school teachers seducing young girls, and... Um, where my act at all had to do with a non-consensual relationship with a B-52 bomber that was older than me because they were all built in the 1950s. They were using them in Syria only two weeks ago. They're, they're still using them. And they're a weapon of mass destruction. They just open the bomb bay doors and napalm, cluster bombs, fuel air explosives. So um, they're the real workhorse of the American military in Vietnam and Iraq and Afghanistan and now, now they're being used in Syria. But they're also nuclear capable. Mm. And can you bring me back to, like, how vivid are your memories of that first arrival into prison? Like, what, can you remember what was going through well, I'd done a, a, a few um, short stints in a maximum security br- prison in Brisbane in the 80s and Bogger Road Jail, and um, that's where I had my last haircut in 1988. Um, and that was, so I knew, we were expecting three to five years, so... I I knew what the environment would be like, and um, you know, every I've been probably in eighteen different jails, and they're all different environments, you know. Um, so you know, if you've seen the film Chopper, that was like Australian jails in the eighties, and um, so mentally you were, for the most part, prepared. It sounds like. Yeah, I was in. I mean, the eighties was in a, a faith-based community, and. Um, you know, we'd, we'd we'd prepare and reflect together on on uh, not only how to survive and thrive in jail, but how to be supportive of uh, of the prisoners' struggle, which we got involved in, and we closed that jail eventually. And uh, it was also a beautiful flip that many of the young Aboriginal people who'd stayed with us in our house were now in prison, and they were offering us hospitality in their, in their house, the big house, and you know, telling us how to be safe and smuggling us vegetarian food and all sorts of stuff. So it was really nice mutuality about that. Mm. And I'm just going to uh, rewind another bit again. I'm just curious about that, those teenage years. Um, am I right in thinking you might have been into like punk music or you know what? What was the other teenage Kieran like? Um, or was it all? Was it all politics? Was it all justice? It was. It was. Uh, it was a Christian Brothers school, a uh, very working class school. It was half Italian and kind of half Irish descent. Um, I played a lot of football. Uh, soccer was a big focus for me. And um, and then, you know, I, as, you know, I'd often argue with uh, the religion teacher about you know, the IRA and stuff like that, and I got expelled from school for protesting the Queen's Jubilee visit. Well, not um, for moral turpitude, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, but by the end of my schooling, I'd come to a position of pacifism. I thought pacifism was implicit in Christianity, and um, eventually also concluded that, that an anarchist orientation and a pacifist orientation are implicit in can, can you talk to me a bit about anarchism briefly because uh, it's it's so it seems to me that it's so misunderstood in its yeah I mean I uh, both my anarchism and pacifism are rooted in my discipleship and uh, my my attempts to follow Jesus so I don't know if anarchism can stand alone um, without some kind of base like that or pacifism can stand alone um, and I what, where the point I'm at now is I think, you know, I'm a radical Christian disciple, and radical is not a scary word. It's not a word left over from the 60s. It's a Latin word. It means to return to the roots. And I think the roots of Christianity have an anarchist orientation toward power and a pacifist orientation toward violence. And because they're negative definitions, one meaning without 
violence and one meaning without exploiting people they're much better questions and answers so an anarchist should be someone who lives with the question how do i live without exploiting people and a pacifist how do i live without violence and they're much better questions and rather than a rigid you know uh, just add water and stir um trite response to everything so i th- they're, they're kind of more orientations for me i think um but you know i would have read uh you know kapotkin and all that kind of stuff as well so um and i think too in europe the radical traditions are much more socialist and social democratic in the united states they're much more libertarian anarchist and um so i began in my late teens drawing a lot of nourishment from the what was called the Catholic left in the 60s, but the Daniel and Philip Berrigan and that draft board raid movement and Dorothy Day, um, who was just dying when I she died in 1980, um, around the time John Lennon was shot down in New York, and um, uh, she had lived like that since the 30s. So, yeah, tell, tell me about Dorothy Day because you know, uh, she. I think she's up to be sainted, isn't she? Yeah, I, I, I guess another theme for me, because I missed the 60s, I was too young for that. And it's, you know, I remember Joe Strummer saying he was too young for that too. And it was like arriving on a battlefield after a battle. And and it, uh, I was really concerned about selling out. And I guess in Christianity, that means to remain faithful, you know. And I re- went and tracked down a lot of people I'd read about in Brisbane who were active in the 60s and tried to talk to them about you know what happened you know and uh how you know do they feel co-opted or not or <clears throat> um so that was always a concern to me it was more about being faithful and um so dorothy day had been seen you know uh, faithful for 50 years and i was very interested in being a long-term lifelong uh, project, you know. And so, for for people who may never have heard of her, like who was she? Where's she from? Okay, she's from. She, uh, her father, I think, was a, a jur- journalist, and um, she too became a journalist. And she would have mixed in the circles uh, with John Reed and Emma Goldman. Um, she wrote for the masses. Uh, she was a suffragette. She was jailed for opposing World War One. And if you ever see a film that's really suppressed, uh, I was just talking to Harry Brown about this the other night, a film called Reds, directed by Warren Beatty. And he won the Best Director Oscar, but you never see that movie. And it's about John Reed, uh, who wrote 10 Days That Shook the World. And throughout the movie, they cut in and they have people from the 1920s speaking straight to camera as the narrative goes on. And they wanted Dorothy Day for that film, but she was dying. She was very ill when the film was made in 79 or 80. Um, So... She um, has her own um, conversion story. Um, she had, I think, one at least, maybe two abortions, and it kind of you know, Bohemian promiscuous scene. She was operating in with Eugene O'Neill and others, and then she was in a relationship with an anarchist, and um, I don't know if the phrase is fell pregnant, but became pregnant. <laughs> And uh, she thought that was quite miraculous because she didn't think she could have a child. Um, And that initiated a kind of conversion for her and she found a lot of solace. So she converted to Catholicism. Um, And uh, but brought with it uh, her desire for social justice and her anarchist analysis of capitalism. And she met uh, an old French eccentric kind of guy, Peter Morin, who had a critic... Because this is at a time where totalitarianism has a popular base like Mussolini gets voted in Hitler's popular Stalin's popular amongst the left around the world and this was a very much an anarchic personalist response to kind of totalitarian solutions really and the so when the depression hits she and Peter Moore and start the Catholic worker movement and which is based on houses of hospitality practicing the acts of mercy rather than looking for big states new deal solutions to unemployment and poverty and encouraging people to rediscover, you know, feeding the hungry, sheltering the homeless, and that kind of solidarity. And then... Back to basics. Yeah. So I guess the three things, the themes I kind of try and embrace is, 
you know, community building and affirming and whether that's a faith-based community, you know, an intentional community or whether that's a broader idea of a network that, uh, that I'm part of in Dublin of, you know, people of different faiths and no faiths um, in the struggle for peace and justice and solidarity with Chelsea Manning over the last few years. Um, and so that's a community and from that, uh, the acts of mercy, uh, solidarity with the homeless and the poor, very directly and then then non-violent resistance so we would say that each of those themes give each other credit and authenticity and like if all you do what did was community it'd become very self-indulgent and therapeutic if all you did was the acts of mercy it'd be like mopping up after capitalism if all you did was resistance it'd be like a disembodied voice you know so those those three things give each other in- integrity i think mm. So, yeah. yeah, and just uh, thinking about that time of totalitarianism and like how many, like it's, it's hard not to draw some parallels to where the world is at today. No. So it strikes me that these themes are ever more present, ever more relevant. How, how I've heard different debates on how similar today is to the 1930s. Mm. Uh, do you have a view on that? On well, the, I know, think... Macro politics. I think with technology, and I've you know I've had quite a bit to do with Julian Assange for the last six years, and he has a pretty, <laughs> pretty fearful analysis of where technology is taking us, and um, their surveillance techniques. Uh, uh, you know, Snowden revealed are pretty total, and yesterday's expose of the CIA. And um, I remember asking Chad Myers, who's a theologian. Uh, that's influenced our movement. He wrote a very good book on Marx Gospel called uh, Binding the Strong Man. And when the when the war began on Afghanistan, we had a meeting with him in London. Um, he's from California. <coughs> and um, I asked him in the pub, I said, well, how's the movement going? And he said, well, the problem is anyone under 30 is now a lot more kind of brainwashed in terms of sophistication of social control and he said, anyone over 30 in the movement seems to be hopeless at mentoring the young. <laughs> so I thought, oh. um, so that, that was interesting. And um, yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, obviously the collapse of the Soviet Union in 91 and that, that there was no longer a balance of, um, it became a kind of one empire world and now you've got the growth of China economically and... It looks like anything could happen. I mean, there could be a nuclear exchange on the Korean Peninsula in the next, <laughs> next week. Yeah. What is Assange's take in terms of the technology aspect? So, I mean, we, we kind of now know about surveillance to some extent. I'm sure there's more we, we will find out. But uh, where does he think it's all going? I, I think in... <sighs> you, you've been in the... You've met Assange. Yeah, I was with yeah. Julian like three weeks ago. Yeah. Um, and I had a longer session with him last year. And, uh, you know, the, a, a lot of people think that people will be voluntarily putting chips in their head and, uh, and by 1930. And if you look, you know, you're on a tube. By, by when, sir? 19. He, he thinks 1930, but I was, I was speaking. 2030. 2030, sorry, yeah. Um, I was raising this on a soapbox speaking in Hyde Park and there was a techie from LA there and who didn't like Julian and but he said it's going to be a lot earlier than 2030. Yeah, yeah, there's a tech journalist in the US right now who's voluntarily put a chip in his wrist uh, so he could demonstrate how he could pay for all his meals for a month by just scanning his wrist. But he, you, you know, you're on a tube in London or a bus here and everyone's on a smartphone, like disconnected from the people sitting next to them. So it's just like downsizing that and making it more um, <laughs> portable, I guess. Yeah. And um, I have read a bit of research that suggests that. Uh, we're at a slight tipping point in that a, a good percentage of people will volunteer their privacy and their rights for the sake of what they might perceive to be convenience. Yeah, so, yeah. so a lot of people will go for that. A well, lot of people know, we know we're being monitored. Yeah. I mean, we know our data isn't no. private, but yet there's a volunteering over there. Yeah, I, I guess it's, I mean, I'm not that sophisticated on this stuff, but you know this whole thing about singularity and yeah. um yeah and people seem quite willing to surrender their privacy on facebook even or you know like yeah. um 
And in terms of surveillance, like traditional surveillance, what? Like, and, and also the, sur the surrender of solitude. Okay, uh, yeah, I remember yeah. someone remarking that, uh, that, you know, the idea of solitude is abandoned and, and privacy. And so, you know, the demand is that there should be transparency of the state and privacy for the individual. But at the moment, we've got <laughs> total surveillance yeah. of the individual and, yeah. and cover ups for the state. Yeah. And in terms of, uh, you know, traditional surveillance, how, what, what level of interactions have you had with uh, surveillance that you're aware of? Uh, well, because you've, I mean, you've had numerous brushes with the law and with the state, and including Ireland, which we'll talk about in a, in a short time. Yeah. Um, uh, have you been aware of when or how you've been surveilled? Yeah, I mean, I was with Special Branch Tailing two weeks ago um, for two days. In Dublin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you, right, okay. When you say us, it's just... Well, I was just chatting with Quiva Buddley on, on this on the street and she you know and she's a lot more alert than i am and we had a guy behind us and then i don't know how much he heard but another guy turned up at lunch the next day we were making a, an arrangement to have lunch together in cornucopia and um <laughs> he didn't order any food so maybe he wasn't a vegetarian <laughs> so, so yeah that and previously they stopped the vehicle i was in so can, can i stop you on that because a lot of people are uh I would say suspicious that that happens for instance so mm. you know somebody might say well you're paranoid that was just a guy who was just in there and <laughs> right. thought he was in a burger joint and couldn't yeah. find any food like how do you know his special branch well i um i trust her judgment i mean she's lived a lot in palestine and lebanon and iraq and she's a lot more seasoned and that kind of stuff yeah. and yeah so um previously we were they pulled up a car on the way to the bridget's festival i was in and we hadn't left dublin they wanted to know if we we're going to shannon um and this is also weird because this is the recent afri bridget no this is um five or six years ago okay. i think and then actually more recently at, at bridget's festival it was the 10th anniversary of our action Okay. Special branch, you know, I was in Ireland. They turned up in Kildare at the Bridget's Festival. Oh, it's and, Bridget's, a, it's a, <laughs> and I, I was actually at the, staying at the Shannon Airport Hotel uh, with Deidre Clancy, and we were there to mark the tenth anniversary. But um, so I'm not saying, you know, I'm not saying I'm flattered by this. I'm not. Yeah, well, I'm, I mean, but no, but I'm saying, I mean, a lot of these guys haven't got much work to do so they'll take someone like me and spin me into a threat and and the the actual when they pulled up their car and i challenged them about taking people's names they said oh we've got mr o'reilly here a self-confessed eco-terrorist and i said you know that's bullshit and i said um i just flew ryan air i'm hardly ecologically sound yeah. <laughs> um and do you think that at some level that that's their category that you could be slotted into they, they just want to slot you into some sort of terror because it, yeah of, yeah i think they've got a very broad definition of terrorism yeah because terrorism isn't the guy who's flying the b-52 dropping bombs no. on entire villages or towns terrorism is just one guy with a mask or yeah or with dreadlocks or, or, <laughs> and it doesn't it, it even means property damage too i think and yeah and so that, that, that let's go back to the let's talk about the property damage because that okay. was really at the core of your action at shannon Right, um, and and this there was a lot of outrage that you damaged property, yeah. uh, which is quite interesting, and in, particularly in the Irish context, because we have a, a love for property in our constitution. Oh, right, yeah. So, well, <laughs> well, let's maybe not a love, yeah. but uh, it 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 has a lot of weight. So, talk to me about the action in Shannon and and how that came about. Okay, I mean the action in Shannon for me was my third plowshares action and a plowshares action is a, is a faith based action of attempting to beat swords into plowshares as predicted by the prophet Isaiah and um, my first one was on the eve of the Gulf War in 91 in New York on a B-52 in the uh, runway and a, plow, a plowshare being a agricultural yeah kind of it's the idea yeah. of tanking something that is implicitly uh, a killer of human life and transforming it into something that nourishes human life. Yeah. And um, so th these actions were pioneered by Phil Berrigan and others who'd come out of the, the non-violent resistance of the Vietnam War. Um, 
and I also did an action with Trina Lenthal and Jabaluka. We disabled uh, uranium mining equipment in 98. Um, and uh, so I was in Ireland in 02 and, um, and obviously America was mobilizing. For, well, it's really pretty much the same war. It's been a 26 year war in Iraq and um, it didn't stop in 91. It turned into the sanctions and um, and then uh, the full-scale invasion and occupation, and now it's a new phase. And um, so we, uh, I had, uh, I was in Bally Furman at the stage, and I, I started these kind of weekly liturgies. Um, and about four or five people would come to them, and reflect, and and then quite rapidly in November I, of '02, I met Deidre Clancy for the first time in early November. Carmen Trotter from New York came over and was doing a bit of speaking. She turned up for that. And then mid-November, I met Damien for the first time. Um, January 1st, I met New and Dunlop for the first time. And I knew Karen from London. And within a short time of us meeting, we were all in jail in Limerick Prison after uh, doing $2.5 million worth of disarmament to US Navy war plane that was en route to Iraq. And... Uh, so it was a, compared to the B-52 when we were in an 11-month process taken away every second weekend by people like Phil Berrigan and elders and prepared for an action that could cost lives, it could cost years in jail. This was pretty rapid and then um, and successful. You know, it was, uh, it, it, um, was probably the most disruptive action to the mobilisation for that war. Um, and that's a sad thing because we didn't have a lot of competition. <laughs> but... Um, you know, I, I, I would think if 1% of the people who marched against that war had non-violently resisted to the point of imprisonment and the other 99% had done proactive solidarity, we could have gone a long way to stopping that war. And most of the non-violent resistance didn't come out of the civilian peace movement, which marched in its millions. It came out of the military. And obviously, you know, the, the most um, severely sentenced person was Chelsea Manning in that. And... Um, so that's why I've, you know, I've been the recipient of a lot of solidarity in my jail time, and uh, I felt it was my time to focus on on Chelsea and Julian, and um, you know, I, I organised prior to that, I organised around eight different plowshares trials uh, in England and Australia and the states and Ireland. So I, I had that skill set, and it didn't seem to, there was a lot of hostility to Julian in London, engendered by the Guardian newspaper, whoever. I think Glenn Greenwald recently remarked there's only one person the Guardian hates more than Jeremy Corbyn, and that's Julian Assange. Uh, what, what exactly uh, is the beef that the Guardian has with Assange? Well, initially I thought this is a kind of a cultural and class issue that um, here's this hippie kid who went to 32 schools, his mother's a puppeteer, um, becoming this media rock star in 2010, and you know the resentment of Guardian journalists who all went through Oxford and Cambridge um and you know australians are very direct uh and it's seen as culturally obnoxious um and then i talked to a guardian feature writer and he said no it's more significant than that it's um it says what journalists value is to be the gatekeeper of secrets who gets to know how quickly they get to know when they get to know and wikileaks comes along and throws up all the primary data and say you work it out you know so it undercut their status and their financial base and then there's also speculation that the grand jury indictment includes some Guardian journalists along with Assange. So maybe the Guardian is saying, we'll give you the head of Julian Assange, leave our boys alone, you know. Um, so that's speculative, that third one. Um, yeah, so... Uh, so so go back to Shannon and, and the trial process, because that lasted for four years, didn't it? Or? Yeah, three and a half years. Um, so... You know, we had a very short time of preparation, like two of the people had never met the other two eight days before the action. And it was all very rapid. And we thought the war was going to begin in the February. It didn't start till about March 20th. Um, and we were at our best in the hangar, in jail and in the courtroom when we needed to be our best, you know. And we were kind of stuck together for three and a half years. And... Uh, and, you know, as the anti-war movement that was large evaporated, um, that required a kind of stamina. 
um, to keep raising the issue. The war was ongoing. The anti-war movement was not. Our, our prosecution was ongoing. And we had we received a lot of gifts. We, uh, we received a very talented legal team that came together, and some of the best barristers in Ireland and a very good solicitor, Joe Noonan, um, <laughs> later found out this was his first trial. <laughs> so... Um, uh, and then others like um, Jimmy Massey, who'd, who'd been in the war and been involved in killings in Iraq, came to testify on our behalf from the US military, and uh, Kelly Doherty and um, Dennis Halliday uh, had a big position with the UN during the sanctions. I think you got a presidential pardon in the middle of We it. did, yeah. Martin Sheen gave us a presidential pardon. Seems yeah. the president in the West Wing. So yes. that was in, uh, was it in Damien's hometown in Offaly? No, it was in Shane McGowan's hometown, Boris Akane, Tipperary. Okay, right, gotcha. And that, that that was where Martin Sheen's mother's from, is yeah, that right? Yeah. yeah, she, it was her 100th anniversary and uh, he and his siblings... Martin's siblings were over for a mass. Because okay. uh, Martin Sheen would be very sympathetic. Yeah, Martin Sheen has a long history with the Catholic worker. When he was an unemployed actor in New York, he used to eat at our soup kitchens, and he met Dorothy Day in the 50s. And, and then he became quite big in uh, in Hollywood, and then he had a heart attack making Apocalypse Now, and that kind of brought him back to the church, and um, he came back to the church through the Berrigans, and uh, one of the first things he does is he plays the role of the judge in a film about um, the Plowshares 8, the first action in 1980, and... Um, and Martin, yeah, I think he has great stewardship of celebrity. And you know, whether he likes it or not, when he steps out at his front door, the spotlight's on him. So what he do, does is move next to marginal people, whether it's anti-war resistors or El Salvadorans, and the media have to reluctantly follow yeah. them. And I think that's a great stewardship. And you know, people look at me, and I, you know, got dreadlocks down of a butt, and in Ireland, and they don't initially trust me. But when Martin Sheen puts his arm around me, they think, well, I trust that guy. So yeah. he, you know, yeah. so. Yeah. I think uh, celebrities and lawyers play that in American football. You'd call it running interference, where you're kind of defending the quarterback. Yeah, you know. yeah. I mean, he he's been arrested. He has, times, yeah, he? yeah, yeah. So he, he, he no, he's a very a very good guy, yeah. and um, and uh, I think he, he had special words for you at one stage, didn't he? Yeah, I was in Australia at the time. Yeah, yeah. But that did he call you his, his personal hero, which is very sweet. Hero. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> uh, no, he, 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 there's no doubt he's a special character. I've seen him interviewed a, or heard him interviewed a few times. Yeah, he's definitely a voice of conscience. That's for sure. Um, so, like, there was there were, there were several trials, and there was bumps along the road, and you had to do the stamina and the staying power, and then. Yeah, there was one particular trial that collapsed was very interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you tell us about that and why you Well, collapsed? our first trial ended when the judge acted illegally um, after I gave evidence and he denied a witness without hearing legal argument and the barristers just jumped on that and he uh, he had to uh, abandon the trial and... Um, so six months later we were put on trial again and that that, that judge seemed to know about the first trial so he let a lot of evidence in and then he was going to rule out our legal argument and the legal argument was that we damaged uh property to at shannon to preserve the life and property of others in iraq and um we went we called for an adjournment and um we had an angelic apparition who told us that um that judge was a personal friend of george bush and was invited to both inaugurations attended the first one and we remembered that in the, when we were choosing the jury, a woman who'd been chosen on the jury stood up and said, look, I've just remembered that my daughter's an airline hostess and um, it might look that I'm, like I'm prejudiced. And our barristers jumped up and thanked her for her integrity and the judge thanked her for her integrity. Uh, but he didn't mention his connection to, to George Bush. And uh, when we confronted him, we had to decide... Uh, uh, do we want to confront him with that? And um, I was like, what's the negatives? And um, the negatives was we'd, we'd piss him off and it's sentence heavier. And we just all looked at each other and said, let's confront him. And we did confront him and he fled the courtroom. And um, uh, it's saying, I'll talk, to, I'll talk to you and judge and chambers to the legal team, but they just waited for him to come back out. And uh, he came back out in such a rush that he forgot to put a media gag on it which the first judge had done. 
and so then I think the next day there were photos of him and George Bush and he'd had a long relationship with Bush he'd been introduced to him when he was governor of Texas and yeah. uh, well it's it's often how all establishments work and through the nexus of technology business media sport or whatever is that you get to go to certain events and you meet certain people and yeah uh, power works in different ways as, as you felt but then they an angel appeared and I'm not going to ask you to name, name the angel but uh, I'd be very curious to hear another time uh, I remember the time as well that like you did say there was media coverage the next day but uh, I would have felt watching it at the time and aware of the issues today that media typically are shy of these issues uh, in perhaps some of the reasons you talked about in relation to the Guardian but yeah there could be class issues, there could be filters, there are political lenses. Oh, yeah, like in Australia, the, the biggest contribution Australia makes to American warfare and killing is Pine Gap. And you never hear that in the mainstream media. That name is never mentioned. And that's the NSA base out in Alice Springs that targets cruise missile and drone attacks. And um, So, yeah, there is a censorship on anything to do with Pine Gap in Australia. And, and there's a censorship on Shannon here. And, like, people... Uh, surprised that that the US military is still using Shannon. Because yeah, I mean, the two and a half million troops have been through Shannon. Yeah. Uh, we like to wag our finger at, at Trump or whoever else. But, but you look at the WikiLeaks cables from the Dublin embassy following our acquittal, but also following our action. And the Americans actually offered to leave Ireland and the Irish government begged them to stay. They could have flown on to their bases in England, etc., and that was under, I believe, Bertie Ahern? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dermot Ahern was the Minister for Foreign Affairs. And yeah. You know, I might yeah. be wrong on that. But, but yeah, this is Fianna Fáil, the Republican Party, uh, yeah. upholding the values of peace, justice, equality after Irish <laughs> independence, if you like. Um, yeah, I... I mean, and then I think that was... They were aware that this was a huge identity crisis for Ireland. That, I mean, when I was growing up and possibly facing the draft you know if the vietnam war had continued there was talk in our house about shipping me back to ireland or something like that so ireland was always perceived as neutral and that neutrality came out of the militant anti-conscription movement during world war one that should be recognized and celebrated and which flowed on to australia uh, the irish catholic church in australia defeated the government twice in world war one on the question of conscription um so neutrality really comes from that it, and um and you know Ireland could play a great role as a, a peacemaker third party um, thing if they took themselves a bit more seriously and that and our Ireland has incredibly incredible cultural capital a uh, huge Irish jasper in the United States and Australia in the military as well and if Ireland had taken principal principal position I think Germany and France opposed the war they wouldn't have been alone um, and they if you read these cables you can see the government thinking oh it's amazing we're getting away with this you know they were really really worried yeah. and they continue to be worried yeah. after our acquittal i got up and said they said what are you going to do next and i said well, i hope to get 100 people together and go and occupy the runway yeah. and then they spent two million euros in the next six months and uh on that they described it as a threat i said it was a promise rather than a threat but um so they're really really concerned uh and and they felt humiliated by our action and because it only happened a few days yeah, after yeah. Mary Kelly's action and the plane had just been repaired and we, we disabled it again. So, so everything you do has both actual and symbolic. So, you know, the, the action of putting one plane out of action is one thing, but the symbolism of, uh, you know, a fragile community coming together to disarm uh, looks forward to a world of... Of disarmament just like feeding someone a bowl of soup has a pragmatic but a symbolic that you hope everyone will be fed one day and stuff like that so so whatever you you do um uh, has this kind of actual and symbolic factor to it i think you know and, like you did make history in that action in the in the sense also that you were quitted by a jury you forgot we're, to mention that yeah we were unanimously acquitted and which is very rare in dublin um if there's any acquittals it's usually 11 to 1 or 10 to 2 and harry brown wrote a good book called hammered by the irish and his critique of the irish media's lack of coverage of the case is, is quite interesting um it's you know it made time magazine the acquittal but it, got, it there was no one coming up saying well, we haven't been allowed to interview these people because of subjudice for three and a half years. Who were these people and what motivated them? That's rarely happened. 
from the Irish media. Um, so yeah, it was it was you know as Chad Meyer says, the media covers the war, literally covers it up. <laughs> and um, and for us, I guess uh, yeah, anti-war resistance primarily uh, it's a primary thing for me because it's a relationship between peace and justice. Like Pope Paul VI said, if you want peace, work for justice. And the flip side of that is true too. If you want to maintain an empire of exploitation, you better prepare for war. And so there's a relationship between peace and justice and violence and exploitation. So a B-52 mightn't be dropping napalm today, but it's used in the same way as a gun is used in an armed robbery without it being fired. It's a means to exploit. That's And that's why um, we focus on, on the military and, and war and preparations for war. Um, where do you... So we live at a you know a crossroads in relation to power the us russia china all of the, all of that um what's happening in syria i think it's the seventh anniversary sixth or the seventh today or it's we're in that kind of time zone yep. but uh, i'm just wondering where you personally see chinks of light or signs of hope um i think in people's uh faithfulness and people's resilience and um there is some beautiful signs of hope and they're not celebrated like right at the beginning of the war in afghanistan two train drivers in scotland refused to transport arms and now everyone should know their names in the anti-war movement you know? what are their names i don't know their names know <laughs> we names, should all so. know let's go and google that yeah so you know we've got to find those hopeful stories and share them and celebrate them yeah and um you know chelsea manning is uh, all all chelsea had to do was what we we're asked to do and they're not asking like in vietnam for the conscription of our young um there are all they're asking for us is to avert our gaze to look the other way and if chelsea had done that in baghdad when she saw uh evidence of war crimes um she wouldn't have been locked up for the last seven years um so all we're asked to do is avert our gaze they don't they don't want active support for the war or active opposition they just want um, our silence and our sedation so any break out of that and it comes from the most amazing places, like Ben Griffin, who was in the British SAS, deployed in Iraq, refusing to redeploy and then going on to start Veterans for Peace. So there's now 500 ex-soldiers and Air Force and Navy uh, organised in England who are anti-war. And that's a great sign of hope. And I, I was at the Veterans for Peace Christmas party in December in London. And, you know, these guys had been through... There's Jim Radford, who was 16 at D-Day there, you know, he's 80-something. There was young guys who'd been in the Battle of Basra. There was Michael Lyons, who'd read the WikiLeaks cables and refused to deploy to Afghanistan and went to jail in Colchester. There was such a variety of experience and um, uh, and people from the French Navy in the Gulf War and all sorts of Vietnam veterans. And uh, So, yeah, the, the Veterans of Peace phenomenon has really struck me as, as very, very hopeful, yeah. Kieran, we we'll leave it at that. It's been an absolute pleasure, and I wish you a safe passage back to uh, Australia. And no doubt you'll be back like a boomerang. Hopefully. <laughs> Cheers, Mike. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Love and Courage podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. I'd really love if you could subscribe to the podcast, rate it, and review it, and spread the word on social media and wherever you can. While I love doing these interviews, they take a lot of time and effort in research, production, post-production and publicity, and there are some costs involved. If you would like to chip in and help the podcast grow, it would be really appreciated. All contributions welcome and monthly patrons can receive a Love and Courage t-shirt, badge, special mentions online and discounts on future workshops and events. And this support helps me to help others in the community in my day-to-day work. My sincere thanks to all of you who have already supported in so many different ways. Also, just to say, I sometimes take on social change media, communications campaigns and strategic projects and do talks and presentations, workshops and schools and colleges, community centres and at conferences. Topics range from mental health and personal 
personal development to use in community empowerment, leadership, activism and social innovation. If you're interested in learning more about any of this, please let me know. So to get in touch, to offer feedback or suggestions or to make a financial contribution right now, log on to loveandcourage.org or send me an email to podcast at loveandcourage.org. Thank you so much for all your support. Until next time, here's to you, to all of us and to having the courage to create big change in our lives and in the world around us.